Hi guys, I'm Marie. And I'm Maddie. And uh, this I'll- is Lost in the Woods. <laughs> this is the podcast that we do. We just finished recording a bunker talk, so I was like My mom has no idea what's going on. I was unsure of she where to go. She just shows up for recording. Shut up. <laughs> I just prepared myself to get hit. I'm surprised I didn't. Anyone who knows what's going on knows that Maddie's full of it right now. I don't know. I didn't sign up to recording this right now, so... So I'm like, Maddie, hurry up. We got to go record our bunker talk really quick. And then we finished the bunker talk, and I'm like, hold on, Maddie, let's do a little bit of our regular episode. She's like, wait a second. I did not sign up for this. How did I get entrapped into this? Yeah, so it's been a super busy week. I'm like kind of far behind, and I have a lot going on on my computer screen right now, and Maddie's like kind of giving me a hard time for it. So... We're going to throw it out there. If anybody would like to contribute to research and not get paid... At the moment, and we will eventually get paid. (laughs) Just basically, like, waste your life right now. Just waste your life right now, which is basically what I'm doing. Um, And, yeah, we're taking applications. You will get paid nothing. and We'll send you any merch that we get that we have (laughs) for free. We will also give you, like, props on the podcast as well. So, we are only taking... Only taking serious applications, please. And you have to be really good at research because I do a lot of research. I read books for some of our episodes, which I did for this particular one that we're recording right now. And guess who absolutely sucks at research? Which is why I need a helper. So somebody help me, please. Because it's honestly like <laughs> one of my my weakest, weakest, what is it, attributes? We're, we're still trying to find um, Madison's contribution. In this book, Twitter. I started the Twitter account. I, I, I started you, it. I just told you you haven't responded to like three people. Shit, I have to respond. To yes, people. that's part of running the social media. Damn it. So if you don't know this either, if you're being responded to on social media. It's not me. It's it's me. It's not Maddie. So don't get your hopes up. <laughs> you're not talking to me. You're, you're talking to the hot mom. You're talking to the old lady, not the young, not the young hot not mom. Not the one you would think would be running the social media accounts because you would think it'd be me. But also, if I do reply, it will not be a well-formulated sentence. Okay, so today we are talking about the Yosemite murders. And this is a listener recommendation from Jason Baker. Thanks, Jason. Hopefully I got the right ones because apparently there's been multiple, but this is like dubbed the Yosemite murders. This case is about the disappearance of Carol and Julie Sund. And Silvina Peloso. We're going to get into this entire story. And spoiler alert, it is called the Yosemite Murders. So uh, I don't know you if know, you can guess uh, what happens in this one. Yeah, but. Uh, but they go missing from the Cedar Lodge. And we're going to start off by telling you about an incident that happened at the Cedar Lodge in 1998. So it was three Finnish tourists that were asleep at the Cedar Lodge Hotel. It was two young women and one older woman. And about around 2 a.m., they woke up to this rattling sound. Someone was jiggling the handle of the door. Can I just tell you that that's like straight out of one of my nightmares? Yeah, and obviously someone was trying to open it. Why else are you jiggling a door handle? Why are you trying to get it open? Which they had locked the door before they went to sleep, and they knew this. But it sounded like somebody was still trying to get into the door with a tool or a key. Trying to pick the lock? Something. Hell no, I'm sitting there. I'm calling 911. I'm pepper spray ready to go. So they called the front desk and said that someone was trying to break into their room. By the time the security was notified, the person was gone. Whoever was trying to break into the room was gone. The hotel maintenance man checked on the door and it peered. Does that say unmolested? Yeah. Can we choose a different word for that? What's wrong with that? I don't I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> okay. The hotel maintenance man checked on the door and it appeared to be unmolested. No. No, you need a different word. I need for a that. different word. Okay, than that. pick a different word. <laughs> it appeared to be untouched, not picked the lock. The lock wasn't picked. I don't know. I don't like that word. I don't know what <laughs> word to use instead of it, but I do not appreciate that. Okay, perfect. Either way, no forced entry appeared to occur on the doorknob. This put the woman at ease, and they went back to sleep. Nope, that would not have put me at ease. 
I know what I heard. No, I don't give. A, I, I don't give a damn. I what want, maintenance man says. I want to move to a different room. I want to move to a different hotel. Yeah, let's just let's just get in our car and go to a different hotel. That's what I would do. One hundred percent. We're doing that. We have packed up at night all of our stuff and left because we felt uneasy. I feel like we would change rooms or at least change nope. hotels. I, we would change hotels yeah. for sure. But another thing that I will always do now for now on because I've seen it in multiple movies, TV shows, things like that. Before I go to bed and I'm at a motel, I'm going to check the vacancy sign. If it changes. Once no, you get there? Once I get there, I'm gone. I'm gone. If it changes while I'm there, like before I go to bed and I'm in my room, I'm leaving. I support that, actually. End of story. That is straight out of a horror movie. Also, if you are not seeing other guests around, Red get flag. out now. Out. Yeah. So the next year, February 15th of 1999 is when Carol and Julie's son and Sylvina would end up at the same hotel. Okay. Carol's son was 43. Julie's son was 15. And Silvio Peloso was 16. Julie and Carol are mother and daughter. And they're close family friends to Sylvina, who was an Argentine exchange student. Okay. Or is coming here. She's always wanted to travel to the U.S. And while she was there... They really wanted to make the best of her experience and show her as many sights as they could while she was in the United uh, States. I know. That's not okay. Sylvina was very introverted. She was more quiet, more stoic, where Julie was a lot more outgoing. Sylvina was due to return home the following month in March. So her stay in the U.S. was almost over. I don't like that. The family had already taken her to Disneyland. They had gone to Fisherman's Wharf. Like, they had already gone to a lot of places. Yosemite and Grand Canyon were on their list, and she was scheduled to go to the Grand Canyon after leaving Yosemite. They were headed to Yosemite. They were going to make the best of their road trip. Carol was very in a very extensive planner, so she had a lot of things planned for their trip. She had actually been to Yosemite before because she went there on her honeymoon. And her husband, Jin, he actually gave Carol her Valentine's Day present before the trio left because they would be gone on Valentine's Day and he wouldn't see them. Okay, so on Friday, February 12th, the three head to Yosemite National Park in California. They flew to San Francisco and rented a car for the drive. Obviously, you got to rent a car. You oh, for sure. A bus. You can't take a we, Public transportation in California, are you kidding me? We usually rent a car just about everywhere that we fly. They also were planning on going to Stockton College for a cheerleading tournament and an official tour. Yeah, so Julie was a cheerleader and she was competing in this competition. Gotcha. She also is the one that wanted to take the official tour mm-hmm. because she was considering it for her college. Gotcha. Yeah. And then on Saturday which would be the 13th, they attended the cheerleading competition. They made plans to go back to the college on the 16th at 2 p.m. before heading to the airport. Okay. So while they were at this competition, they actually ran into friends from home that were also there for the competition, and that's who they made the plans with to come back for the official tour, and they actually scheduled it through the college. After their night at the competition, they stayed at the Ramada Inn in Central Valley. The next day on the 14th, which is a Sunday, Carol visited Costco and withdrew $200 from an ATM and stocked up on food and snacks, heading heading off, heading to the road, driving, going to head off. Before heading out or before, before heading out hitting on the, the road, road or... Before heading out on the road. I don't know. That sounded really weird. And we've actually done this. Like when we went to San Francisco, we actually stopped at Costco one of our days. We ate lunch there. We got a pizza for dinner. Oh, yeah. Because we decided that we were going to take all our food money and actually use that to go to Alcatraz and to Six Flags. Yes. Which weren't originally in our budget. No, those were that. So all our food, because we (laughs) we got we saved up plenty of money to get to go out to dinner and like almost every night and like Mm -hmm. do that kind of thing. Yeah. Then we decided we wanted to do other things. So then we decided to literally eat like crap the entire time we were in San Francisco, just so we could go do other things. Dollar menu at McDonald's, lived off of Costco muffins, which the Costco pizza we ate 
for dinner. And then we ate some of it the next day too. It was really gross by then. But this is actually not a bad strategy. So they arrived at the Cedar Lodge sometime afternoon. And in case you didn't catch it, it's Valentine's Day. There was snow on the ground, and they were assigned to a room half a football field away from the main area. Yeah, so this lodge, you guys, it has, like, a main area, and then it has, like, these big buildings kind of around it. So it's, like, the one hotel off of Criminal Mines. Well, I was it was, like, the where, refuge that we stayed at in Iceland. Someone turned an old military base into a Ref- hostel. Uh, yeah, it was—we stayed there. It was really cool, actually. But so they're kind of off on their own— like in this building. And this was a very busy weekend, but because it's Sunday now, Sunday afternoon, most of the hotel has now cleared out. So usually there's a lot of traffic through here, but two things happen. It's Sunday afternoon and the main road to get there is closed down from a certain time of day to a certain time of day, which prevents more traffic from coming through there. Yeah. Also, they were the only occupants in their entire building, and their room is on the ground floor. Room 509. And if you guys don't know, in a motel, the ground floor rooms are a little more dangerous because it's easier access to people who aren't in the hotel, right? So each room had a door that opened to the parking lot and could easily be accessed without entering the hotel at all. Right, because this is like a building off on its own. On February 15th, the next day, which is a Monday now, they got up early, they bundled up, and they headed out. They visited a lot of touristy locations like Yosemite Falls. They went ice skating at the village skating rink. They had snowball fights. They ate. They went souvenir shopping. Naturally, as you do. Yep, and they have a lot of pictures documenting this day. When they got back to the hotel, Carol called her husband where they talked about their plans to meet at the airport the following day, where Sylvina would fly with him and their other three children to Arizona to go visit the Grand Canyon, and Carol and Julie were flying home from there, right? So Carol needs to get back. Julie needs to get back, I'm assuming for school. They're heading back, and before they head back, they're dropping Sylvina off with the dad, and the other three kids, which is two boys and a girl. So they talked about their plans for that. She said they were planning on venturing out a little bit in the morning and then keeping their appointment at the college before heading to the airport. Their conversation only lasted about four minutes, which I think part of this is it's been a long day. Carol's tired. They need to eat dinner, you know, get to bed. The trio had dinner at the hotel restaurant. They paid their bill at 7.35 p.m., which was 21.13. Don't know why we need to know that, but you know. The girls ate burgers. Carol had a veggie burger. So Carol hadn't finished her burger, and she had asked to have the rest of it wrapped up for her, but she actually forgot to take it with her, and it sat on the counter until closing time, but she never came back. They went to the gift shop nearby the front of the hotel where they rented a couple of videotapes, and they went back to their room. Okay, so the following day when Jin's flight arrives, after being delayed five hours, that would suck. Right, and he had no way to contact Carol because she did not have her cell phone on this trip. Mm. So he basically is just hoping that when he gets to the airport, he'll be able to get a hold of her. Yeah. He tried having her paged over the loudspeakers, but there was no sign of Carol, Julie, or Sylvina. The connecting flight to Arizona departed right away, and he had decided to board the plane without Sylvina, hoping that Carol could get her on another flight, or they would all miss their flight and have to make arrangements. Right, because remember, he's traveling with three other children. Yeah, and children in an airport sucks. Well, not only that, but they, because their flight was so delayed, they have no layover. They have to go straight to their Arizona Mm -hmm. flight. So he's thinking, okay, our best bet is going to be for Carol to get Sylvina onto a plane yeah. when they do get here. Yeah, just to get her on a plane instead of getting all of them onto another right. plane. Yep. Not a bad plan. He didn't really worry about Carol because she was very prepared and very resourceful. Right. Her and Julie had actually taken self-defense classes, and she got pepper spray for Christmas that year, although she did not take her pepper spray with her, and like I said before, she did not have her phone with her, which when you fly, I'm not sure if you can take your pepper spray. No. On the plane. So that could explain why. 
I would assume not. I would assume not either, but I'm really not sure. I know what you... I know a lot of things that you can't take on a plane. Knives. But I don't know about pepper spray because I've never tried to take that on a plane and got busted for it. Also that morning, a dispatcher of the Sedona Courtesy Cab Company got a call from a man that was stranded on Highway 108 and needed a ride back to Yosemite. The driver picked him up at 10 a.m. He was a tall, trim, athletic man looking to be about in his 30s, and he was wearing a baseball cap and carrying a backpack. He appeared to be tired and a little worn out, and it was clear he hadn't shaven in a couple days. He said his friends had ditched him and that he needed a ride back. He paid the $125 cab fare up front because this is a long drive. This is like an hour-long drive. Jeez. He said that he was late for a rewiring job with the National Park, and when they got to the Ranger checkpoint where they were told they had to pay $35 to get in, he said that he shouldn't have to pay it because he works for the park. And when he was asked who he worked for, he said he didn't know and coughed up the $35. Yeah, so here's a red flag for me. You should know who you're working for. If you work for the park, you have park service stuff. And yeah, you, you would know. You would yeah, know. Yeah. You would have a pass. You would have something to get into the park for free. Maybe he just didn't want them to know where he worked. Okay, so it's the following day, the 17th, and Jin is in Arizona with the three other kids. And he went to go play around a golf that day, and he wasn't too worried until later in the day when he still hadn't heard from his wife. Fearing that she'd been in a car accident or something, he contacted California Highway to see if there had been an accident, but there was no accident. So then he called Cedar Lodge, where he was told that it appeared that they had checked out as planned, although they just left the keys in the room and never came to the front desk. Red flag. Also, a lot of people, you check out that way now. It's not a key that you need to specifically return. I mean, I rarely... Well, is check it, out at the front desk. Is it a key key or is this Cedar no, it's like Lodge? No, it's like a card key. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know, but they said it's not unusual for people to just okay. leave. So I honestly don't know what kind of key it is. All right. Then he called the rental car company and he learned that the car had not been returned. It had not been returned at all. Not as planned, not on the day, not the 17th. It's gone. So then at this point, he notifies the sheriff's department. So... Search parties started combing the park, but saw no sign of them or their rented red Pontiac Grand Prix, which this is a bright red, pretty vehicle. Well, it, it's a pretty unmistakable vehicle, right? And it's an, it would be an easy vehicle to track down. At this point, the thought is kind of that maybe they got lost or had gotten into a car wreck. So they're looking around for them, but they're not super concerned yet. They searched the hotel which hadn't been touched since they checked out. So nobody had gone in to clean the hotel or anything like that. They found the rented movies on the table from the night before. There were wet towels on the ground. An apple, a paper bag full of souvenirs. Red flag. Something's wrong. Yep. There was also tomato juice in the fridge and their luggage was gone. Okay, so I feel like the rented movies on the table... Eh, whatever. They rented them from the hotel. Yeah, so why would they bring them back? Exactly. Wet towel on the floor, normal. Because they would have showered before they left. Nobody wanted to take the apple or tomato juice with them. Yeah. It's gross. The bag of souvenirs. How old are the girls? 16? Nobody in general is going to leave a bag of souvenirs, especially a 15 and 16-year-old girl. Agreed. Not going to leave behind souvenirs. Agreed. No one is. Who's even going to leave a bag of souvenirs they bought? But especially not. Our souvenirs were in a paper bag as well. When we got them in Europe, they were in a paper bag and we just kind of moved them from place to place with us. But never did we leave them behind. Mm -mm. They found out later that day, too, that they had missed an official tour of the college that they were supposed to go on before they boarded the plane. Oh, so they went missing like midday, early, mid-morning, like mid-morning because their tour was at 2. Yep, before they got on the plane. All right, so on February 19th, four days later, a teenager found a wallet with Carol's driver's license and credit card. This was in Modesto, California, about 80 miles from the lodge. And it was found in the direction that the group would have traveled to go back to the airport. 
All right, all right. So now they're thinking, okay, they at least made it this far. Or did they? Or did they? So later that day, someone called into Carol's bank asking for a replacement card claiming to be Carol, but was unable to provide information. Yeah, what? How are you going to? I really don't know. Why do you think that's going to go well for you? Right? I don't know. Hi, I'm Carol. I'm, I need a new credit card. Oh, and oh. I need you to send it to a totally different location than where I actually Am. live. Yeah. Oh, well, what's your social security? What's the last four digits of your social security card and your birthday? Well, I don't know. Uh, Click. Yeah. So then two days later, a call came in again wanting to know her bank balance and provided her social and was given the balance, but they were unable to track the caller down. Who found out her social? I don't know. No? And when Carol's wallet was found, her cards all seemed to be there. Weird. A $250,000 reward is offered by Carol Sun's parents, and still there are no leads. They also charted a plane to do an aerial search and hired a private investigator, all of which led to nothing. There was a sighting of the three asking for directions to a meadow in the park, and... A couple sightings at hotels along their intended route, but none of these panned out to be the trio. And I think that tends to happen when there is a reward involved, Mm -hmm. is that anybody that slightly fits the description of the missing person gets reported, which can, you know, go nowhere. For sure. And then on February 26th, another $50,000 reward was offered for locating the car. And this, I must say... Is the first time I've seen a reward offered for finding a vehicle, and Mm -hmm. I think it's genius. It's, oh my God, if we lived in that area and there was a $50,000 reward, I'm like, put your fucking shoes on. We're going. Let's go. Let's go drive some back roads. We are going looking for this car. We are going to find this car. Because doesn't it seem like it would be easier to find a car than people? Than people? Yes. I don't know. Or like to recognize But the car has to be somewhere. Yeah. Cars don't just disappear. People disappear. So cars this is the first time I've ever seen this. And I, like I said, I think it's absolutely genius. Over 900 tips were followed up on. 50 FBI agents are working on this case and over <laughs> 7,000 miles have been covered. 50 FBI agents? Yeah. I think that's like the most FBI agents I've seen working one case. Right? Part of this might be because they were thought to be on federal land. Because of the park. I don't know if that has something to do with it or the influential family. They have a lot of money. And yet there was no evidence that a crime had even occurred. America's Most Wanted even did an episode on it. Um, Funny story. One of my friends is cousin or uncle that they hadn't seen in years. And then they were all watching America's Most Wanted and saw him on it. Really? Yeah. Like imagine not talking to someone for like five years and then seeing them on America's Most Wanted. I feel like that could happen in my family. Yin and others close to the family were obviously given polygraph tests and everybody passed. They found no indication that the family was involved at all. Yeah, I don't think I'd look at this case and think that the family's involved. Well, there's no family even nearby at the time. Two staff members of the lodge come under suspicion. Naturally, because this is the last place they were seen. Yeah. So one of them was a sex offender and had visited Modesto where Carol's wallet was found. Mm Mm-hmm. The other was a janitor whose name was Billy Joe. Billy Joe Strange. Great name. That sounds like a made-up alias to me. Your last name was Strange. Your parents could have come up with a better name than Billy Joe. I know, right? They kind of they kind of dropped the ball on that, but I still like it. He had a history of domestic violence and attempted to run when police were looking for him. Suspicious. Or you're just a criminal and you see cops and you run. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So he also failed a polygraph test, but there was no evidence linking him to the disappearance and he was released, but remained a top suspect. So like we said again, polygraph tests, they not admissible in court. Yeah. Admissible? Know. Admissible. Yeah. Not admissible in court. You know, everybody knows how we feel about those. Yep. So they interviewed another janitor named Carrie Stainer, who had been working at the hotel for a couple of years. Although he was laid off at the time. I think he had been laid off a month 
prior, but he was still living at the lodge. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. So they do that a lot in places like this where you'll get laid off during the slow season and then during busy season, you'll get picked back up again. So a lot of times seasonal work will just stay put and they'll go hike and do whatever, their own thing until it picks up again. You know, that doesn't sound too bad to me, yeah. honestly. So a month after they go missing, there is still no sign of them. A vigil is held and a poem written by Carol's younger daughter, Regina, who is 13 at the time, is read at the vigil. And this is part of it. Late at night, I await your return, but deep in my heart, I know something my mind doesn't want to learn. What is this thought? Even I do not know. Soon the running river will become solid snow. I shiver at the thought of what I might have to see, whether or not my mother will be. At the time when I need my mother's touch most, all I see of her are pictures nailed to a post. When it is time for bed, I rock myself to sleep with memories of you held tight in my heart, memories that I will always keep. I try to be strong because I know that's what you would want, your baby to be, but mommy, I don't want you to leave me. That is terribly sad. It's so sad. And she's only 13. That's actually a really good poem. Uh, Like she knows that she's not alive anymore. Well, and I mean, she says that, right? Like soon the running river will be snow because everything's starting to freeze. There's snow falling. I await your return, but deep in my heart, I know something my mind doesn't want to learn. She knows that she's dead and just doesn't really want to accept it. Mm. Well, because I think by this point... A month, right? Like, they know she wouldn't take off. They know this family didn't purposely disappear, which leaves very little alternatives at this point. On March 5th, Billy Joe Strange was arrested on a parole violation, but this was really just to get him off the streets. Right. Like, he's a suspect in this case, and they're like, well, we can arrest him for a parole violation and at least get him off the streets. Yeah. So on Thursday, March 18th, Jim Powers was out shooting in the woods about 110 miles south of the lodge and stumbled upon some red car paint and a license plate. Nearby, he found a torched car. Yep. The paint was almost completely burned off, but he recognized the car and he contacted authorities. Police quickly identified it as the rental car. The car had been doused with gasoline. A woman's hiking shoe and intact can of Coke were found nearby. Don't like that. Hiking shoe. Nope. It was the next morning when the trunk was finally opened. No. And inside the trunk, they found two charred bodies. They could not identify who it was immediately. Well, I mean, the paint is burnt off the car. I would imagine that a human body in the trunk wouldn't do so well. On Sunday, March 21st, a search yielded the keys to the Pontiac, a handheld CD player, and a roll of undamaged film. So the film was developed and depicted photos of the girls and Carol over their trip. They are posing in photos with beautiful scenery and ice skating. Okay, so the final picture is one taken of Sylvina and Carol sitting across from each other on the twin beds of the Cedar Lodge. It's a candid photo and appears that both looked at the camera and smiled at the last second. Carol appears to be rummaging through her purse in the photo. Right, so taken by Julie, it's assumed. Yeah, she probably was just like, hey, smile. Yeah. I'm amazed the film survived the elements. All right, so on March 21st, a cross was placed at the location where the car was found. On March 22nd, dental records confirmed that one of the bodies in the trunk was indeed Carol. Uh, So that leaves Julie or Sylvina Sylvina to be the other body. On March 24, an anonymous letter arrived at the police department. No. It was postmarked for March 16, and should have been delivered sooner. It had a crudely drawn map and a message. The note said, we had fun with this one. What the fuck? Confirming what police believed, 
that there were two assailants because they said we had fun with this one. Mm -hmm. DNA from the envelope and stamp were entered into the system, but there were no hits on it. But there's DNA on the envelope and stamp? Uh Uh-huh. Yep. What year is this taking place in? Oh, yeah, 1999. Didn't you have to lick stamps at one point? This stamp was licked. That's what I was going to say. Yep. Stupid. Why are you licking an envelope and a stamp <laughs> to send to the police? We're ki- like confessing murders. What's wrong with you? Are you stupid? Searchers followed the map with a cadaver dog where they found the body of 15-year-old Julie's son. This was about 30 miles from where the car was found. Her legs were duct taped. Her arms had been folded over her chest. She had been raped, and her throat had been cut so severely that she was almost decapitated. (sighs) Fifteen. She's fifteen. I can't. Dark pink fibers were also found on her body. So then they did determine that the other body in the trunk is Sylvina. At the memorial service, daisies were handed out to the over 1,000 visitors that came, and they were handed out because they were Carol's favorite flower. This guy in prison, so can I go kill him? All right, so police rounded up a bunch of meth heads and local sex offenders and even some employees at the lodge. So out of all these people, they arrested two with criminal records and wrongly accused them of the crime. Although they did look good for it and failed a polygraph test. And even confessed at one point. (laughs) All right, cool. So a woman named Rachel Lou Campbell had Carol's credit card number and she was associated with the suspects. In Fresno, a grand jury began taking testimonies in the murder. They also matched the fibers found on Julie's son to the car fibers of one of their suspects. The FBI was sure they had their killers. But they could not have been more wrong. So at this point, the FBI is actually publicly stating that they have their killer in custody. So things are calming down. Things are kind of going back to normal. People are starting to relax. On Wednesday, July 21, Joey Armstrong left work at 5 p.m. and headed to her cabin. She worked for the Yosemite Institute teaching children about nature. Fun. Fun job. Fun job. Yeah. She had recently moved into a cabin with her boyfriend and another roommate. And they live down an unfrequented road. So they live kind of like in the middle of nowhere a little bit. The night before, she had come home to an empty house for the first time since moving in because her boyfriend and roommate were both gone working. She was tough the first night, but then the second night, she decided to go visit a friend out of town until her boyfriend came home. Okay. And part of this was because she had been scared when the three murders took place, but she felt better knowing that the persons responsible were behind bars. And she even wrote in her journal, the monsters are gone. When she got home... She put on some music and started packing for her trip. She called her boss and said she was going to drop off some work files on her way out of town, but she never showed up. On the 23rd, Joey's friend called the authorities when she never showed up for her visit. They showed up for a welfare check and found music playing. The door was ajar and her car was still there. No, the music playing in her house. Her bed was in disarray. They found a hat and broken sunglasses that did not belong to Joey or her roommates. And they found debris everywhere. They also found tire tracks at the scene. Don't worry, though. Police did not believe it was related to the Yosemite murders since she lived about 30 miles from the Cedar Lodge. Their bodies were found 110 miles from the Cedar Lodge. I know. And you think 30 miles is a little bit too out there? Well, but remember, they think that they have their man, their men in custody right now. Maybe you should rethink that now. So they searched the stream near her cabin the following day, and around 1.30, they found her headless body in a drainage ditch. It appeared that she had been chased into the woods where she put up a fight and had a cut on her wrist like she had been defending herself. Her head was nowhere to be found, but they were still able to identify her. So obviously we have a missing woman 
a hundred yards away, we find a headless body. We're pretty sure it's going to be her, right? I'm pretty confident that I could identify my friends and family members by their headless corpse. Yeah, for sure. Duct tape had been used on her, and they found hair and fibers and body fluids on the bed sheets indicating that she had been raped. A U.S. Park Service firefighter was driving along the road leading to her road the day that she went missing, and he saw a familiar car there. It was a blue and white SUV, and he knew who owned the car. They tracked it to a man named Carrie Stainer. It was thought that he might have seen something related to the Joey Armstrong murder. Wait, isn't Carrie Stainer the other janitor that they interviewed? Yep. That was really helpful and involved himself in the investigation? Yep. God damn it. How didn't I see it? Actually, I low-key kind of saw it before. (laughs) I was like, this guy is suspicious. All right. So, Carrie Stainer was a handyman at the Cedar Lodge. He lived at the lodge, and he had lived and worked there for about two years. He had been questioned when Carol, Julie, and Sylvina went missing, but he had been ruled out as a suspect. Yeah, I would like to know why, what technique they used to rule him out. Who made that call? I don't know. Ugh. Well, and like we said earlier, he wasn't technically working when the three were murdered. So maybe that has something to do with it, but he still lived there. I would like to know what made it so they could rule him out. So police said, get this, that he just didn't set off any alarm bells. Yeah, because serial killers actually are usually pretty manipulative people. It's kind of crazy. Well, and he was really chatty with them. He even told them a story about his brother. But that's what they do. I know. That's what they do. They're chatty. Uh They're the most conversating people, and they'd like to tell you stories about their... Well, and remember, he opened doors for them and helped them. So he allowed police to search his car, but wouldn't let them search his backpack. Yep. Police were thinking that maybe a head could fit in his backpack. I don't know about you, but my head is pretty backpack sized. Right. And when he was protective of his backpack and wouldn't let them look in it, they were like, "Mm, we're going to need that backpack. Yeah. They told him that they would just seize it and get a search warrant. And he allowed them to search it. In it, they found a camera, a beer bottle, sunflower seeds, tanning lotion, a harmonica, a fictional crime novel called Black Lightning, duct tape, a knife, and a 22 caliber revolver. Without any further evidence, he was released. Are you f- fucking... This man has duct tape, a knife, and a 22 caliber revolver in right. his backpack. But he's also a handyman, and he's also like a hiker and stuff, so none of this is out of the question for him to have. But guess what he did when they let him go? He fled. I'm sorry. But maybe you should have tested his knife for blood or something? Or, I don't know. I don't know. I do not know. But he probably shouldn't have been released. On Friday, July 23rd, Carrie didn't show up for work. Shocking. On July 23rd... Uh, they found Joey's head. It was floating about 40 feet downstream from where her body was found. Why? Why? Police did catch a break, though, when a manager at the Laguna Nudist Colony called to say he was there. At 9 a.m., they show up to pick him up from this nudist colony that he was staying at. Don't worry, you guys. He was fully clothed and eating breakfast in the cafeteria, although there were other people eating breakfast naked. I don't know a whole lot about nudist colonies, but if you're wearing clothes in a nudist colony, wouldn't you just... Well, this was actually a place that he went on a regular basis. So he went to this nudist colony. He would pitch his tent and he would hang out for a few days. This was something he did on the regular. He was actually like a well thought of person there. And he was like a catch because he was younger than like the average guy that was there. And he was like relatively in good shape and good looking. And so all the women were like keeping their eye on him. But my question is, was he a nudist? Yeah, yeah. He would go around nude. He just wasn't nude at the time. Oh, 
And part of that too is that he had been packing up his tent, even though he had planned to stay another night or was scheduled to stay another night, he had been packing all this stuff up. So they think he was getting ready to take off again. He requested to see pictures of little girls in exchange for his statement. Mm -hmm. Like little girls? Mm Mm-hmm. What the fuck? Yeah, the FBI pretended that they were working on this, but they had no intention of bringing him pictures of anyone and instead brought him pizza to try to get him talking. Which worked. He said to police, this will be my last meal as a free man. He told them that in 1982, he had been driving along a back road when he saw a large, hairy, and muscular beast. It jumped up and ran while screaming a high-pitched scream. Guess who this is? Bigfoot? Yep. He said that he often returned to the area hoping to catch sight of the beast again, and he claimed that he was doing just that on July 22 when he saw pretty Joey Armstrong loading her car for her trip. He said that he was just overthrowing rocks in the creek when he noticed her and she seemed to be alone. He went and got his backpack from his car and then approached her. She was watering the flowers on her front porch and he complimented her on how well she kept up the cabin and asked if she had ever seen Bigfoot. Oh, and then, you know, while having this casual conversation with her, he pulled out his gun. Doesn't she live on like a really remote road? Yes. So he's like out in the woods by the creek, he says, just looking for Bigfoot when he happens to see her. Mm which I don't know if I believe that. I believe that. I would guess that he probably followed her there, but we don't know. But whatever. He then forced her into the cabin where he bound her with duct tape. And from there, at some point, forced her into his car. But we do learn later that he did sexually assault her before doing this. While he was driving, she jumped out the window. I like you, Joey. Although it did not help, he caught up with her and slit her throat which is what resulted in her decapitation because he it was so aggressive. He said that it was supposed to be easy and that in his fantasies, no one ever fought back, but she sure did. I hate you, Carrie. Hey, it's almost like Gary. Mom, I'm not liking this case. Can you please just tell me what's going on? <laughs> no. I don't like this. You'll see. So this whole time, because I've probably cut it out for you guys, Madison keeps asking me and keeps like guessing. And then I'm like, nope. And she's like, oh, what is going on? I don't know what's happening. In she's this getting case. very frustrated getting about super it. Frustrated. So then he goes back to February of 1998. Yes. Carrie is telling this story about how he started dating a waitress who had two daughters, the age seven and 10. He supervised the girls while their mother worked. One of the daughters has actually been interviewed and says that her memories of Carrie were some of the happiest of her childhood. Over time, he started fantasizing about killing his girlfriend and raping and killing her daughters. Cool. Or setting their house on fire, I guess. Both of those. Yeah, I mean. So one night, he finally decided to go through with it. On February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day, he went there with the intention of killing them. But... They had an unexpected guest that showed up, and he was unable to carry out his plan. He admitted that there were three separate occasions where he intended on killing them, but something went wrong or he lost his nerve. Right, so he kept making up his mind to go and kill this family, and then things just kept going wrong, you know? Kind of annoying, right? Yeah, real goddamn annoying. (sighs) Did you catch the date on that? February 15th. Uh Uh-huh. Which is... The day that they checked into the Mm -hmm. motel. The Cedar Lodge, yeah. Oh, my. So, when he was at the Cedar Lodge, he got into the hot tub to calm down. Because real stressful when you can't kill your girlfriend and her children. Yep. He was soon joined by two teenage sisters that were staying at the hotel. He started planning his plan B, which would be to rape and murder them. His plan was foiled when he found out that they were staying there with their dad. He said that he was walking when he saw a red car in the 500 building all by itself. The window and curtains were open and he could see inside that there were two young women and no man around. They were literally just in the wrong place at the wrong time. At 11, 
p.m., he knocked on their door and said that he was there to check on their bathroom because there had been a leak upstairs. Carol refused to let him in, and he said that he would have to go get the manager, and she relented and let him in. Hell no. I'm not letting anybody in my hotel room. I don't give a crap if you say you're staff. I want a manager. I want multiple people in here, and I'm not letting a man into my room. Agreed. He entered the room carrying his backpack. He went to the bathroom and pretended to look for a leak. He then came out of the bathroom and pulled his gun, telling him that no one would get hurt if they just kept quiet and complied. He took their money and their car keys and then told them to lay face down on the bed. He bound their hands behind their backs and then locked Julie and Sylvina in the bathroom and then returned to Carol where he strangled her with a rope that he had brought along. And then he put her in the trunk of her car. He then separated the girls and strangled Sylvina in the bathtub and put her in the trunk of the rental car as well. He raped Julie. Then he cleaned the room thoroughly and left wet towels on the bathroom floor to make it look like somebody had showered before checkout. It was after midnight when he loaded Julie into the passenger seat. Julie asked if he was going to kill her, and he said no. Then he drove around aimlessly for a while. He pulled into a paved lookout called Moccasin Point, where he took Julie, still bound, and carried her away from the trail to a secluded area where he told her that he loved her and wanted to keep her, and then slit her throat. He actually said that he carried her into the woods like a groom carrying his bride over the threshold. Fuck you, Carrie. Like, seriously? I can't even. And he also said that the reason he killed Sylvina is that she refused to have sex with him. And Julie played along and complied. I'm sorry, but if I'm ever in a hotel room and someone pulls a gun on me and is like, just cooperate and everything will be fine, I'm not cooperating. I'm going to get shot. I'd rather you just shoot me right now in this hotel room. Side note, his gun had no bullets in it. Another thing. And you shoot me, someone's going to hear it. There are people around. He paused on his way out to enjoy the sunrise. Because he's at a lookout. He had planned to abandon the car, but he ran into some fishermen that were going to the lake where this lookout was. So instead, he decided to continue driving, which is why the car ended up so far away from where Julie was, because that wasn't his original intention. His original intention was to ditch it there. So he abandoned the car and then walked back to a payphone where he called for a taxi. And remember, that's where he said his friends had ditched him. He also talked to the taxi driver about Bigfoot, by the way. And he paid for his fare with the money that he had stole from Carol. The next day, he got a little paranoid, went back to the car and doused it with gasoline and lit it on fire. Then he dropped the wallet in Modesto to throw off law enforcement. He also went back to the room and changed the bedding. Right. He said that he had watched a lot of crime shows. And when he started thinking about it, he thought about like all the ways that he could have gotten caught or that he could still get caught. So he started cleaning up after himself. He also sent that letter to police to try to throw them off. And he even put a piece of paper on top and scribbled random names on it so that it would look like somebody had written previously on paper before that one. Like they look in the crime shows, you know? He also paid a fast food kid to lick the envelope and stamp for him. No. Yep. Don't lick anything if someone pays you. Although I make my kids lick my envelopes and stamps because I can't handle it. Yeah. I, my favorite thing is to lick an envelope very dramatically in front of my mother. He also admitted that he had been the one who was going to break in and kill the three Finnish women in 1998. And he had been the maintenance man that was called to check the door locks that night. So obviously he'd been working up to this, you guys. I mean, I just, I can't, I can't even handle it. So Carrie Stainer. So the Stainer family has actually been in the news more than once. Really? Leading up to this, yeah. So there are five Stainer children, and Carrie was the oldest of the five. In 1972, his seven-year-old brother, Stephen Stainer, was kidnapped. He was kidnapped by a pedophile named Kenneth Parnell, who also had an accomplice at the time of the kidnapping, Irvin Murphy. A massive search for Stephen ensued, but it turned up nothing. 
So they had all gone to school basically together. And then Stephen got out of school an hour before the rest of the kids because he was littler and he was kidnapped during that time. Carrie used to say that he would wish on a star every night that his brother would come home. And he would also say that he felt abandoned and neglected and struggled through his youth because of this incident. And we've talked about that before. Yeah, that it is, that happens a lot when a child goes missing and then there are other children is that those children basically get put on a back burner and that's how their entire childhood goes. Yep. And this is no exception. He did have very strict, loving parents. Mm -hmm. I believe they were Mormons, actually. He had very strict and loving parents. He kind of had a rough go of it. And seven years after he was kidnapped, he reappeared with five-year-old Timmy White in hand, who had also been kidnapped by the same man. And just so you guys know, we are actually going to do a little mini for our Patreons on just this case. On just Stephen. On just Stephen and Timmy, who basically when Timmy showed up, Stephen was like, uh-oh, like it's happening again. He didn't want Timmy to suffer the same fate as he did. Uh-huh. So he took him and ran. And when he brought Timmy to the police station, he had planned to return to Kenneth Parnell because that's how conditioned he was. And the police were like, um, wait a second. Who, what's your name? And he said that he knew his first name was Stephen, but he didn't know his last name. Shit. He'd been going by Dennis Parnell for the last seven years. It's a crazy, crazy story. We are going to tell that in more detail on our Patreon. Yes. So if you want to hear the Stephen Stainer case, which is crazy, go check it out on our Patreon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be for five and up or ten and up? Ten and up. Ten and up, Patreons. (laughs) Get ready. It's coming. And if you want to hear it, go ahead and just, you know, sign up for that. And then a year later, Carrie's uncle was murdered during a home invasion where he was shot with his own gun. And strangely enough, Carrie was actually living with him at the time, but was never considered a suspect. Did he kill his uncle? I, I'm feeling very suspicious about it myself. After this, Carrie had a couple nervous breakdowns, one of which was pretty violent. His family got him into a mental institution, but he only stayed there for a couple of hours. Either way, Kind of an interesting upbringing that he had based on these experiences. So one theory is, could this have been what altered his life in the direction that it did? However, he did say during an interview that he fantasized about killing women as early as second grade. Oh, what? Second grade? Yeah. So, So before any incident ever happened in his household... He claimed that he had fantasized about killing. We've talked about it on the show before, but nurture versus nature Mm -hmm. type of thing. Who knows where he would have ended up if those things didn't happen to him, but they probably... Who knows? Who knows? He did have some obsessive behavior issues as a child, such as pulling out his hair. He was known to have bald patches and wore a hat a lot because of this. For sure, there's something going on. There's something going on. Especially when you're doing something that's not only... A painful act, which is why a lot of people do obsessive behaviors like that, it's not only a painful act, but it's also going to affect your appearance. And you probably want to stop, but for some reason he couldn't. All right. That's enough of that. On July 24th, Carrie took police on a guided tour where he led them to the knife that he used to kill Julie Sund. He also, during all of his interviews and all of his everything insisted that he acted alone. He was very willing to talk to reporters. He wanted a story. He wanted fame. He wanted all of those things. Naturally. For Joey's murder, he pleaded guilty in exchange for taking the death penalty off the table and received a life sentence. Of course. They never want to die. They just want to take other people's lives. For the Yosemite murders, he tried an insanity plea, but the jury didn't buy it. On December 12th, 2002, he was found guilty and received the death penalty. Right, which he'll probably die on death row. They don't really execute too many people these days on death row, but they just kind of sit there. Kerry did try to sell the rights to his story and wanted a bidding war for them. 
to guarantee that he wouldn't profit from his story, he was required to sign a $10 million restitution order to go to the Joey Armstrong Foundation. What's the Joey Armstrong Foundation? It's a foundation that her family started. So they're basically just trying to find ways to prevent him from being able to profit, which in a lot of states, you cannot profit from your crimes. Yeah. That's actually a, a law. I don't think you should but be But at to. this point, I don't believe that it was. Got you. To spare her family any distress, he was also forbidden from talking about her death. The Sun and Peloso families also filed a suit against the Cedar Lodge. The Sun family settled for $1 million, and the Peloso case went to trial but was thrown out. So basically, the premise of their case was that the Lodge allowed this to happen because they didn't run proper background checks. They didn't take measures to make sure that people staying there were safe, basically. This is interesting. After the discovery of Julie's body, it ended all hope that anybody would be found alive. But the Carringtons did not simply withdraw the reward money, but instead, out of the $250,000, they paid $50,000 to Jim Powers for finding the car. And the other $200,000, they set up permanent offices to start a foundation for missing children, which their primary purpose was to create rewards for families who are unable to post a reward themselves. No, that is cool. That is cool. It's very cool. The same week, actually, that Carrie Stanner was charged with the murder of Joey Armstrong, the Carringtons had already put over $100,000 in rewards on cases, mostly in California, one of which was a $10,000 reward offered by the foundation, which led to an arrest of the suspect in the case. So... Before he even went to trial for the murder of Carol, Julie, and Sylvina, they were already putting that money to good use solving other crimes. That's cool. So here are some questions that we have about this. One thing that really still bothers me, because Carrie says he acted alone. Who called the bank? Yes. Who? So if it was Rachel, who is, remember, associated with the two other suspects, in this case, the original suspects, how did she get Carol's information? Card somewhere she used Well, the card, you know what maybe? I was thinking? One thing that it could have been is the hotel where they were staying. That's where they worked, right? Somebody worked there, maybe gave her the credit card information. But then how did she get Carol's social Digging, maybe he she called somewhere. Yeah, I don't even know. It's so bizarre. Another thing I was wondering is, did anybody from, which I couldn't find this anywhere, but did anyone from her family try calling the bank to see if she had used her card when they couldn't initially find her? You know what I mean? Like, could it be explained possibly that way? Possibly. But this Rachel person did have her information. Hmm. It's know. very bizarre. I don't know. You know what really bothers me in this case? What? The police did not contact any cab companies after they found the car to try to determine how they got home from abandoning the car. Because the cab driver came forward after he was arrested. The cab driver came forward afterwards and said, yeah, I, I picked him up there. But nobody had ever called the cab company to find out if anybody had called for a cab that day. Which they think they're suspects. They think it's more than one. So they're thinking they drove a separate yeah, car. So they just weren't looking into all the possibilities. They were going off of their theory that they had. Which, but imagine if they had called the cab company. They had found Carrie right away. Joey Armstrong could still be alive. So yeah, the cops had this idea that they had multiple suspects. Tunnel vision. Yeah. They had tunnel vision with it. And they, that's what, I think that's why they didn't look into the cab company. But that also happened with our Patreon episode that we just recorded that's about to come out. Oh my gosh, you guys, the tunnel vision. On that one is it's nuts. Madness. And we don't even, we, I mean, we don't even know if we're right about our theory in the case, but I, I can say with some confidence that I think that we are right with I the case. I think we're right too. It's a crazy, crazy, crazy case. I'm just kind of afraid of owls now. Let's just say that. Yeah, if you want to hear a crazy story that may or may not involve an owl. You can make up your mind about that one. Yeah. After sure. listening to it's it. It's very controversial. Okay. Which I don't know how it's controversial. That, In my opinion, it's a very clear cut. Like what Maddie's saying is that we have tunnel vision now. <laughs> yes. I believe that that is what happened. And um, I have tunnel vision about that case because you'll see. 
One of my sources for this case was the Yosemite murders by Dennis McDougall. Is that the book? That's the book that I read, yeah. He did a really thorough job. It's a great book. He actually talked to Carrie Steiner, Mm -hmm. and Carrie was, like, going to give him the opportunity to, like, kind of interview for writing his, like, autobiography, which he didn't do. But it's kind of funny. Like, he did interview a lot of the family and a lot of different people like that. So I didn't read the book, but... You heard it. It's good. Go list, go read it if you want more. <laughs> I, I of It's course. called The Yosemite Murders. It was a good book. I enjoyed it, actually. It's a good thing I like to read. I don't know. But it's a good thing one of us likes to read. Because I know. It's <laughs> true. It's no. true. Okay, so let us know what you guys think about this case. If you want to hear about the early life of Carrie Steiner and his brother, Stephen Steiner, who was kidnapped at the age of seven and reappeared at the age of 14, come listen to our Patreon And speaking of Patreon, we have some new Patreons. We have new Patreons. Oh, also, if any of our German listeners know how to write a German P.O. Box address, that would be great if someone would get back to me on that. (laughs) Because I tried to Google it and have come up with no. (laughs) The address is written very strangely, and it's... German and it's a P.O. box. So we're like trying to figure out. But like you got to like write the street name first, but I don't know what the street name is because there's not a street name. There's just a bunch of different numbers and an abbreviated letter. And I. This week I put Maddie in charge of the Patreon send outs. And it was actually very painful to listen to her trying to figure it all out on her own. I was, I don't know how to write a German address. I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble with that one because. Uh, indeed. Someone could please get back to me and please help me because the internet is no help. <laughs> okay, so our new Patreons, we have Mariah Kuntz. So, Mariah Kuntz, welcome to Patreon. We're so excited to have you. We also have Alicia Werbles. Werbleski? Werbleski? Yeah, let's go with that. Alicia Werbleski. Werbleski? Werble. Take the one I said before that. Don't take these ones <laughs> because I said it pretty good without thinking about it. Now I'm thinking about it too It was hard. the say it with confidence thing. Werbleski. <laughs> Somebody called that out on our last episode where they're like, I like when Maddie's like, just say it with confidence. <laughs> If you say anything with confidence, only minimal people will question you. Okay. And then we have Amy Barrett. And Amy is spelled really cool. I like it. Maybe it's not Amy. Is that, would you pronounce that Amy? Okay. So welcome, Amy. I think that that's how you say your name. It's spelled really cool, but that's how I would pronounce it looking at it. Let me know if I got it wrong. Um, and we probably did. We probably did. And thank you so much for your support. We love you guys. You're amazing. But yeah, and everybody else, come join Patreon. We have exciting things coming up on Patreon. So exciting. We do have some very exciting things coming up. We may or may not be taking a trip, actually, hmm, to one of our cases. Maybe, and maybe all of it will be posted on Patreon. I'm not oh, really sure yet. Maybe. Hmm. But yeah, thanks, you guys, and... We will talk to you next week. Sadly, this will probably be less traumatic for me than my day was. And we're basically going to talk about a bunch of people getting murdered right now. So, yeah. I don't welcome. Know. I- yeah, welcome to this. Um, but yeah, today was interesting. Phoenix got on the bus for the first time to go to school today. Maddie wasn't here for it. She missed it. But uh, it was not good. It did not go well. It was really bad. I cried a lot today. Sad. It was so sad. Okay, so she like gets on the bus and they load from the back to the front and she's the fourth kid to get on the bus. Oh, no. So her assigned seat is like almost the back row she's like the second row from the back but their names are written in tiny letters like black permanent marker just up above the seats where they can't even see it it's so high up there so she gets on and the bus driver's like go find your seat your name's above it and she walks halfway down the aisle and then she's looking around and then she just burst into tears and I was like oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god so like I'm like outside the bus trying to get her attention through the window and I'm telling her just to keep on going and I'm pointing at like where her seat is and she's just bawling and I'm just bawling. It was so 
so bad. The bus driver actually messaged me <laughs> after dropping Phoenix off at school. And she's like, just so you know, Phoenix stopped crying. She was smiling when she got off the bus. Everything's fine. And then her teacher emailed me and said that she wouldn't play with anybody at recess and stood by the door crying, waiting to go back in. And then I cried some more. <laughs> no, she said it wouldn't play with anybody else. No, she's so shy. I was so traumatic. That's so sad. So today was traumatic for me. Tomorrow will hopefully be better. She sat by the door at recess and cried. Yeah, like where they're supposed to line up to go back in. Like she wouldn't she wouldn't go out there. It was no, I can't. I can't. Phoenix did tell me that like three other kids cried in class today, so that made me feel a little better. And one of them had to be carried out because they were pitching a fit. <laughs> At least your kid wasn't the one pitching a fit. She's just crying. She would never. She's just silently standing in the corner with tears streaming down her face. She's like me. It's fine. We're fine. Everybody's fine. Uh, Traumatic, though, you guys. So we're going to get through this. 